Step 2, Maxwell's first equation. So this equation is all about uh, electric flux, uh, electric fields, and charges. So let's consider a single charge and the electric field uh, that it produces. So we, here we've got our point charge Q. It doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. And I'm sure you remember from your basic EM course that the electric field that it produces can be represented by lines traveling directly out if the charge is positive or traveling directly towards the charge if it's negative. That's here. Positive charges always have electric field lines going away from it and negative charges always have field lines going towards it. This is because if we consider a test, some other uh, small charge, we call it a test charge that we place in the electric field, we want to know, does it move away from it or does it move towards it? In particular, this charge that we place in an electric field, it's going to feel some force. This is the Coulomb force and it depends on the size of the charges, both capital Q and small q, and it depends on the distance between the two charges. So the force is a vector, is given as follows. It's the product of capital Q times small q over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then here we've got the distance between the charges uh, squared. And this r hat represents the direction in which the force is pointing. If the two charges have uh, the same, uh, um, same sign, let's say they are both positive or they are both negative, then this product will be positive, meaning that the force is pointing away from, from, uh, uh, from capital uh, Q. If they are opposite uh, in their sign, so one is positive, one is negative, then uh, this whole force is negative, so the force is pointing towards capital Q. The electric field is given by the following, uh, uh, following relation. So it's basically the same formula, but we just remove the small, small Q there. So you can see that if you are closer towards the source of the field, then it's stronger than as you move away. And again, remember that electric field is a vector. It is both a magnitude and a direction. If it's positive, then it's pointing away from uh, the charge. If it's negative, it's pointing towards it. So putting those, these two things together, oh, and this, this constant that we have been talking about, this epsilon naught, is called permittivity of free space. In later lessons, we will uh, have to modify this constant when we talk about uh, electric and magnetic fields in dielectric materials, but currently we're only considering what happens uh, to electric and magnetic fields if they are in free space. So putting the Coulomb force in the electric field together, we see that the force produced on a small test charge Q uh, is given by the following expression. It's just the electric field rescaled by the uh, size of uh, and the sign of this test charge Q. So now we're going to consider a very important idea that, that will permeate the rest of these lessons, and that's the idea of a flux. And in this lesson, we're going to talk about flux of uh, the electric field. So again, we've got our charge here producing our electric field. And this time, we're not interested in what force uh, a test charge placed somewhere in this electric field will feel. We are interested in the electric field passing through some small area. So we're going to consider this little window uh, described by dA. d just represents that it's a small, small, uh, small area. And the flux through the area is given by the following dot product. We take the electric field E, and we take the dot product with this area here. So we have the following expression. We've got the uh, magnitude of the electric field at that point times the magnitude of the area, the size of the area, and cosine theta. So maybe you're a little bit puzzled by why is area a vector? And in fact, it has to be a vector because the orientation of the area is very important to how much flux we get through the area. If you look at the uh, electric field going um, through this small area dA, you can immediately see that if we orient this, uh, uh, this area perpendicularly to the direction of the electric field, then we're going to maximize the flux going through it. On the other hand, if it's completely parallel to the electric field, then we will not get any flux at all. This is why uh, the area is a vector, and it's represented by this following, following arrow here, which is always normal to the area. 
So if the area is perpendicular, then uh, the arrow would point uh, along the electric field. On the other hand, if the area is parallel, then uh, the vector of the small area will be perpendicular to the electric field, which is exactly represented by here. If, if theta is equal to zero, we know that cosine of theta is one, therefore the flux going through this area dA is maximized, whereas if it's pi over two, then cosine is zero, and the flux also goes to zero. Now we're going to consider a whole surface, a closed surface around the charge. So again, we've got our charge Q, we've got this little area here, and we know how to compute the flux through this area. But now we, want, we are asking a different question. We're asking how much flux goes through an entire surface that encloses and is closed um, around our charge Q. So we're going to consider some uh, fictional surface given by the sphere with some radius r. And already we know how to calculate the flux through this small area dA. Here we are dropping this cosine of theta. Why? Because this uh, not, doesn't matter which uh, point on the sphere you consider, the electric field that goes through that point or that goes through a small area will always be perpendicular to that area. In other words, it will be maximized. So this is, uh, this is our flux going through this small area. And now if we want to know how much flux goes through the whole surface, we just have to add all of these little areas uh, together. So we take the integral over d phi. So the total flux is given by the integral of the magnitude of the electric field at distance r from the, uh, from the charge and the magnitude of the area dA. And the nice thing about this geometry is that we know immediately how to calculate the surface of a sphere with radius r. It's simply 4 pi r squared. So that's our answer. The total flux go going through, um, sorry, the total electric field going through this um, sphere, which gives us the flux, is just given by the product of the magnitude of the electric field times the surface of this area, 4 pi r squared. But also remember, in the previous slide, we said that the magnitude of the electric field, distance r away, is just given by this following ratio. It's the ratio of the charge Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. So we can just equate them together. We can substitute into our flux, and we get that the flux is equal to the magnitude of the electric field, r, uh, distance r away from the charge, times the surface of the area which in this case is just a simple, simple sphere, therefore it's 4 pi r squared. So 4 pi will cancel, r squared will cancel, and all we are left with is q divided by epsilon naught. This is interesting, because no matter how large a surface we are considering, the flux through that area will always be the same. We said that if you move closer to the charge, the electric field, the strength of the electric field will increase, but at the same time, the surface area will decrease. So you see they are nicely balanced. Therefore, the flux stays the same. Uh, do it doesn't matter uh, what, uh, what the radius of the sphere we are considering. It only depends on the charge that's enclosed by the sphere. So okay, this was one charge. What happens if we have multiple charges? So again, we're considering our sphere and there are a bunch of charges that are inside the sphere. Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. It doesn't really matter where they are placed, and it doesn't really matter what sign they have. They can be positive, they can be negative. All that matters is they are inside the sphere. The sphere encloses them. So then, the total charge is just given by, as the sum of the individual contributions from each individual charge. So the total flux going through the surface of the sphere is given by the sum of the char electric charges divided by epsilon naught. And this brings us to our first Maxwell equation, which is just a restatement of Gauss's law for electric fields. We say that the total flux going through a surface is uh, computed as the integral, as a surface integral over a closed area of the, of the dot product between the electric field and, and, and the small infinitesimal area. And that is equal to sum of all the enclosed charges divided by epsilon naught. Here we are introducing this little, little circle for, for the integral sign just to make sure 
just to re-emphasize re that it's a closed area. And so far we have been talking about spheres simply because it's a nice geometry uh, to consider and it simplifies all the calculations. But this is uh, true for any closed area around the charge. We can also have a continuous distribution of charge and then all that really changes is this summation becomes an integral over the charge density in, that's enclosed in the volume that's enclosed by the surface. So this in surface integral uh, on this side really becomes a volume integral. And now the volume is just the volume of the sphere or the volume uh, that's enclosed by the surface that we are considering here on the left hand side. And the charge there is not just a distribution of point charges, but it's a continuous uh, charge distribution. Therefore, we need this rho, which uh, is our notation for charge density in that material. And we will see this, uh, this version of uh, Maxwell's force equation will be very useful when we try to uh, consider differential form of Maxwell's equations.